Why do we celebrate harvest? Well, I think we can all remember the harvest festival, can't we, from school? Everybody have harvest festivals at school? Yes, we all did. And we all used to do the same thing. We used to say, Mom, it's harvest festival. We'd forget to tell her. And then at the last minute, she'd be looking in the cupboards, trying to get some things so we could take to school. Uh, even though we probably knew a week or so before when Harvest Festival was. And we'd go to our school assemblies and we'd celebrate the Harvest Festival. And we'd bring our food. And in those days, the food would be taken off to, I don't know where, but to old people's homes, perhaps, or to other families that were in need. It predated, I guess, certainly uh, most of us, uh, uh, at least middle age. So it probably predated uh, the conception of uh, food banks, etc. But we used to bring our food to the school and we used to give thanks to God. And certainly when I was at school, and I guess when most of you are at school, school assemblies were a lot more about the Christian faith, weren't they? We used to have our songbook. We used to have, sing hymns. And the Harvest Festival was always a time, we always uh, sing uh, harvest songs that we know from, from our uh, childhood, and we used to give thanks to God uh, for those who had, uh, for, for, for the fact that we were able to bring food and that we have food uh, because food and the food chain is all part of creation, isn't it? Uh, it's part of uh, being able to uh, have the ecosystem as we have fi so finely balanced, we, we grow the crops, we, grow, we, we uh, breed animals, we feed off those crops and we have a system of keep, keeping us alive and well uh, through the gift of food. When I was preparing this message, I thought, I know what, I'll Google the Harvest Festival. And this is what it says. Google is a be all and end all now to most people, isn't it? And they believe what it says, but it's not always true. Remember all these devices, software, uh, in, uh, encyclopedia type sites if you like they're all written by man so they're, they're bound to be fallible uh, and you very often you ask anything to do with Christianity uh, or the Bible and um, you'll get I don't know that one um, so let's see what Google said Harvest Festival is a traditional British celebration I thought that was interesting traditional British celebration originating in pagan times We'll challenge that. Now celebrated in churches and schools throughout the country. On a Sunday near the, the harvest moon, usually towards the end of September or the, sometimes in October. So at least we're doing this harvest service on the right day, aren't we? Uh, with the harvest festival, we give thanks for the harvest and the food that has been brought and stored for winter months ahead. So that's what it says about harvest. I think as uh, Christians, we would probably take issue with the fact that it's a pagan festival uh, because my Bible teaches me quite a bit about the harvest and I'm sure that's true of yours. We'll, we'll uh, come to the passage in the Bible when it was first mentioned, I believe, um, which is in Exodus. So what does harvest mean? for the farmer. What does it mean? We know from a farming uh, community, uh, there's lots of different types of farms, aren't there? Uh, there's some, some farms have livestock and they breed livestock, gives us milk, gives us beef, uh, gives us lamb, gives us various types of meat that we eat, uh, chicken farms, all these things uh, are part of the food chain. Uh, some farms are uh, arable, so they will be growing uh, crops uh, or vegetables, potatoes, all the, again, all the things that we need. And then don't forget that there are also seed farmers. So those farmers are farmers that actually grow the seed, which I can never fathom out, but um, they grow crops that they get the seed and then they use the seed and they sell the seed to the farmers, which the farmers then plant to grow the crops. And uh, so there's a, there's a circle of um, production there, finely balanced. Again, from, from a Christian point of view, 
we just accept this as being all part of God's creation, don't we? Uh, but some would say, well, God didn't create the heavens and the earth, so how do we get all this wonderful uh, provision that provides for us? Uh, it can only be through a great creator. So the crop production calendar is common agricultural practice, again, around the world, followed worldwide, and different countries will have different types of farms, and those f uh, produce will be shipped from that country over to our country. We might sh ship stuff from our country over to another country. So there's, there's food and crops and, and animals uh, being transported all the time as part of the food chain. And the, uh, the, the calendar basically is, is, uh, follows seasons. Again, God put all the seasons together. We have the sun, the rain, summer, winter, spring and autumn. Uh, and it all goes and works perfectly well to enable us to grow crops. The farmer has to work hard, doesn't he? Uh, any farmer works hard, but if we think of the farmer that's growing, uh, growing crops or food of any sort, they have to prepare the soil. They have to prepare the soil ready to accept the seeds or the plants, whatever they're doing. And that might include ploughing, it might in include disking, harrowing, and then tilling the soil. So it breaks up nice and fine, ready to take the seed. Then he has to sow the seed. In Bible times, we, we know from the parable Jesus told, they scattered the seed by hand. They had a big bag uh, round, their, round their shoulders, and they used to take a handful, and they'd be scattering seed like this, and it would go all over the place, wouldn't it? Well, farming, farming has got very more technical, and now they actually decide how much seed they need to plant uh, per acre, and in fact, much, much finer than that, probably every inch they know where they're going to plant the seed. And it's all done mechanically uh, with uh, seed drills, uh, which plant seeds very accurately down little furrows, and then it folds the soil back over the seeds. Amazing. I love, I love technology. I love watching anything to do with machinery because it's just fantastic, isn't it, uh, how things work uh, so, so well. And then the farmer has to ensure that crop is looked after. Uh, so that will need uh, watering. It needs the sun. Uh, and we know we so often see uh, crops that are ruined because we get flooding uh, and that destroys the crops. Uh, we get crops that are ruined because we have too much uh, sun and not enough water, not enough rain, and they, they dry up. So the farmer has to, all the time, try and make sure that his crops grow. Uh, and if we've got no rain, he has to water them um, and put uh, manure or pesticides uh, fertilizers, whatever he's using to help boost his yield per acre. He has to protect those crops from, from pests. Um, so again, very often we'll go around the countryside and we see the scarecrow, don't we? And that scarecrow is there for a purpose. It's there to frighten the birds away. Uh, and it serves very well uh, at doing that job. And then, obviously, the time comes for the harvest. And again, Harvesting the crop is, is very precise uh, because if it's got too much moisture in it, it will rot. If it's too dry, uh, it, won't, it won't be uh, so good. So the farmer has to judge exactly the right time when he goes into the field to harvest his crops. And um, he has to do that sometimes battling against the weather. He might have a little window and watch the weather forecast and he says, oh, Doris, we've got a dry day tomorrow. We'll get all the lads out tomorrow on the combine, on the tractors, and we'll harvest uh, the far field. And they'll go up to the far field and they'll harvest that field and get the crops in before the next day it rains. And then maybe they, they have a, a dry day a couple of days later and they'll go and do the near field, whatever it, whatever it might be. But that's how he has to work. He has to work hard all the time, looking after his crops, making sure it's fed to get a good harvest. So harvest requires that practice, that large, uh, a large proportion of crops, if it's not done properly, can be destroyed. And once harvested, the crops have to be uh, stored very often before they're transported to the market uh, or to the food producers. And they have to be kept in certain 
uh, environmental conditions. And again, uh, I've seen some programs on, uh, on farming or on harvesting. Uh, there was one, I think I saw on apples and the, ama the amazing way they looked after those apples and stopped them going rot rotten because it's, they pick them months before you actually eat them. Um, and they, they looked after uh, very carefully to make sure they still arrive in a good condition. And then we see the advert for peas and we see that they, they say they take them straight from the field and they freeze them and they end up in a nice bag in our freezer, frozen peas fresh from the field. Uh, so there's, there's a certain way that crops have to be uh, looked after before they get to us. So the farmer needs to have proper knowledge uh, of sowing, harvesting, methods of storage and producing their crops. So what affects, what affects the crops? Uh, the following factors uh, affect production. So it's preparation of the soil and its fertility, the availability of water and the sun, the avoiding uh, or avoidance of disease uh, through keeping an eye on that crop, perhaps weeding it, perhaps treating it, uh, treating the soil perhaps even before it's sown. He, he might put um, uh, weed killer or pesticides on the soil before he plants the seeds. He's got to stop the pests and then he's having the right climate to get the crops to market. So that tells us something about the farmer. And you say, why have I told you all that? What's that to do with our Christian faith? What's that to do with church service? That's fine, that might be something to do for a good school lesson of how food is produced. But I'll come on to that now. When we look at the next point, what does the Bible teach about the harvest? But before we do that, we'll have our next song, please. So, what does the Bible teach about the harvest? We can first read about the harvest in Exodus, uh, and hence I think Google needs to go back to the, uh, the classroom and look at the Bible before he gives answers regarding harvest festivals. Um, so unless Exodus was considered to be pagan times, I would say that Exodus Certainly in the early history of the, the, the earth, we have the harvest being celebrated. Exodus 23, verse 16. You are also to keep the feast of harvest with the first fruits of the produce from what you sow in the field and keep the feast of ingathering at the end of the year when you gather your produce from the field. So we can see right from the early, early days, uh, we have that uh, pattern of celebration, uh, celebrating the harvest in the Old Testament times. We are to give thanks for the crops. So again, God likes us to give thanks to him, uh, to acknowledge that he provides for us. And right from that uh, early time in the Bible, we read that God has instigated this uh, this instruction to bring the best. And he wanted the best, didn't he? Uh, we know from Old Testament times, the teaching was the best lamb, the best crops, the first fruits, not the stuff that wasn't going to go to market, that was going to get thrown uh, back onto the field and plowed back in. He wanted the best. God wants us to bring to him our best. Uh, and that is... Um, to celebrate and give thanks to God for he, that he provides for us. He provides the right conditions for the crops to grow. The Lord Jesus himself, when he was on earth, spoke about farmers a number of different times in the Bible. And probably one of the best known parables is the one that I'm going to just read now. It's found in Luke chapter 8, and I'm going to read verses 4 to 15. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming, Jesus, to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seeds. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and was trampled on and the birds came and ate it up. 
Some fell on rocky ground. And when it, came, when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture to sustain them. Other seed fell amongst the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other f f uh, seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, whoever has an ear to hear, let him hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. We go to verse 11. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear. And when the devil comes and takes, takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are those who receive Those on the rocky ground are those who receive the word with joy. When they hear it, they have no root. They believe for a while, but in time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who, are, who hear, but they go on their own way. They are choked by life's worries, riches, pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed that falls on good soil stands for those who are noble, with a good heart, hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. So these verses have often been used, haven't they, to explain the gospel message. It's not my intention to dwell on that today, but it sows the seed. A pun there, but it gives us a picture, doesn't it, of how seed can can be uh, s sown some will fall on uh, good soil some will not and that's a bit like the seed of the word of god that's those who come under the gospel the sound of the gospel they hear the gospel message and some it will just pass them by others they might accept it but then the world's pleasures other things earthly pleasures come in and they fall away, they go away, they find other things to be doing, to be spending their time on. And then there's those that hear the gospel, accept it, believe, and they produce a good crop because they go and tell others about the Lord Jesus, about the wonderful gospel of salvation. But I want to look at the whole process of sowing seed and apply it to our Christian lives. So how do we apply it to us today? How does this apply? I want to suggest one of several ways uh, of, of the following. I suggest there's a sower. We could be a sower. I want to look that we could be a crop ripe for harvest. We could be a harvester or we're a harvester's crop that's in storage, waiting to be collected. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, there'll be some this morning that will have spent many years, maybe their whole Christian life, trying to tell others about their faith. So I'm going to say that they're the ones that are sowing the seed. And that can be a continual process. They can be continually sowing the seed through word, and testimony. So again, it's the way we live that influences people so often. And people see that we're different as Christians. And they say, I want to be like that person. What makes that person different? But just, but just that. We have sown the seed. This might mean that we have no knowledge of what happens after that seed is sown. We share our faith, we tell people about it, we don't always see a result, do we? But the Bible says that there is a time between sowing and reaping, and that time could be many years. We've heard different people give testimony that they've prayed for somebody 
maybe at Sunday school, maybe they came to church as a child, and it might be years ahead, it might be when they're an adult, they suddenly bump into them again, and they find that they, they did actually believe the Lord Jesus and come into a faith. So those who are sowing the seed should never get disheartened because you're doing the work of the Lord. We're doing what we should be doing. We're spreading the gospel message through, through our word. We're planting the seeds. But as I say, the Bible says there's a time for sowing and there's a time for reaping. And we don't know God's timing, do we? Praying for people is very important. Very often we have a burden for somebody and we long for that per burden, that, that person to come to faith. It might be our, our own children, it might be our grandchildren, it might be our neighbour, it might be our work colleague, somebody we're perhaps close to and we might be praying for them year after year after year and we never know, we may never know in our lifetime that they actually come to faith in the Lord Jesus. So the seed sowers are important. Then there are those who could be classed as the, as the crop ripe for harvest. The crop ripe for harvest. So they might be uh, people we come across, maybe people within our church that are grown, they're grown in knowledge. They're, they're there uh, standing in church every day, every week, uh, singing, praising the Lord. But may, they do it because it's out of, almost out of habit. And not always have they actually made that decision to follow the Lord. They do it because it's the right thing to do. And they think by actions gives them salvation. And it's not, it's through faith. And sometimes we have people in our churches who are like that crop. They've grown, the seeds have grown, they go to church regularly, they follow a good life, but they've yet to have that revelation in their own heart when they accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their saviour. So that's why I say they're a crop ripe for harvest. It might be just that little bit extra one day and it will click in their minds and they'll realise, oh, I just got to believe in faith. To put it frankly, they've heard the gospel of Jesus, the everlasting love of God. However, they still, they're still in the field. They've grown up, but they've yet to be harvested. And then there are those who we could refer to as the harvesters. So they're the ones that are, are growing, maybe like, uh, again, many of us will be, could be classed as a harvester as well. We're going around, we're spreading the word of God, but we're coming alongside people and we're helping them come to a faith. It might be, uh, pastors, it might be our evangelists, and we think of David and Bob Telford, Ivor Cooper, they're full-time evangelists, that's what they do, they go around telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ, and very often in the churches, they're working in churches, and they're coming alongside people, and they're helping people come to that realisation of faith. They're the harvesters, Sometimes people are looking for an explanation and it might be the harvester that gives that explanation, that just little bit of extra knowledge that helps them come uh, to uh, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The harvester may be the one who reaps the crop. They help a person come to that knowledge. It's incumbent upon us all, really, to be harvesters, isn't it? As believers in Christ, we're told that we should become disciples. We should try to help people grow in their knowledge and trust in Jesus. What would happen if the farmer does not do his, uh, does not do his job properly? Uh, he doesn't harvest his crop. He might say, I've sown the seed. I've seen it's all starting to grow. That'll take time. I think I'll go off for a holiday. I'll leave it in the field. I'll leave the seed growing, the crops growing. It looks as if it's pretty good. That field looks as if it's going to be a pretty good uh, harvest. I'm going on holiday for a few months. 
And he goes off to the sun somewhere and he settles down. He does nothing more to that crop. Who's going to look after it? We read, we, we, we talked about the, the need of the farmer to continually be looking at his, his crop and looking after it. It's just like that in the church life. We need to be looking after Christians, our fellow Christians. We need to be caring for them. The farmer goes off and we have some rain, uh, we have strong winds, uh, and before we know where we are, all his crop he thought was growing up and standing tall in his fields are all flat on the ground. It's all going to be rotten, isn't it? He's going to lose his, his crop because he doesn't pay attention, he doesn't give them time to his crop. And that's how we need to think of us in our churches. We need to give time to those who are in the church, those who are alongside the church, maybe those who are on the fringe of the church, who we come into contact with. We need to give them time to nurture them, to help them, help them to grow, and, help, and one day help them to that point where they can be harvested. Though the farmer has to be ready, doesn't he? for the day of harvest. And as we said, when the, harvest, uh, when the farmer is at that point of harvesting, he has to judge it just right. And very often, if you've been out in the country, you might see combine harvesters working with the headlights on. They're in the field at night, maybe sometimes when it's completely dark, but the har combine harvester and the tractors are going down the field because the farmer knows that perhaps tomorrow is going to be a very wet day and he's not going to be able to bring his harvest in. And he has to work perhaps a whole 24 hours to harvest a field before he, he loses that crop. And that's what it's like. He has to put the effort in to get the reward. Our churches, we need to put the effort in our churches. We need to care for each other, to help each other grow, to care for each other, to make sure we're healthy in our spiritual life as well as our practical lives. We can all face difficulties in our life, can't we, at some time or another? And very often, it's just a word of encouragement from a fellow Christian that helps us. Perhaps go to God in prayer, turn to God. Sometimes we can think we can do things under our own strength, and we just forget that we've got access to God, and we can pray about it. We can ask him to help us, to carry us through those difficulties. What we also need to be looking at, uh, looking after members that are committed Christians, that have faith and trust the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the crops in storage. And by, when I say they're crops in storage, sometimes they might be, uh, and I'm not being disrespectful, but they're perhaps older in years. And therefore they've done their work. They've retired, if you like. They're harvested. They've got that surety of salvation. But in, in as far as their church life is concerned, they're perhaps step, taking a step back. They're no longer on the front of doing all the hard work, all the hard grass. But we need to look after them, our old people. The Bible again teaches about looking after the widows, don't, doesn't it? How in, in those times, there was a, a, a plan in place that people that, that were in need, that couldn't provide for themselves, had to be looked after. And so I see a parallel there, some synergy that we can look at, that the crops that are harvested, we heard that the farmer has to look after those crops. He has to store the grain, uh, grain in a certain way, big silos of grain, has to be dried first before it can be stored. Other crops have to be uh, stored in a certain fashion, otherwise they will rot. And rot comes in, and we don't want that to happen with with their, in our Christian fraternity. We want to look after each other. We want to look after those in our church that need to be looked after. They might need assistance. They might need care. They might need just practical help with transport. But it's just showing that we care for them. And we've got these principles, haven't we, from looking at crop growth to how we can grow in our churches. We looked earlier at a few practices used during crop production. There was preparing the soil. So what's the synergy with that within our church? Well, I think preparing the soil, we could say was perhaps like bringing our children into knowledge 
of church life. It's great to see uh, Ken and Bree bringing their children to church because it helps them to hear. They'll hear the word. They'll, they'll come to an understanding that God is important to their mum and dad. God is important to us. And we're sowing the seed. We're bringing them to church and helping to uh, sow the seed. Sowing the seed, what's that synergy to? That's a synergy to being in the church and we're preaching the gospel. We're telling other people about the Lord Jesus Christ. We're telling them about salvation. Irrigating. What's irrigation? What's the parallel to that? I'd suggest that is going along to church, being part of a church family, reading our Bibles every day, praying every day. This is helping the crop to grow, helping us grow as, as Christians in our knowledge and our faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. The application of manure and pesticides and fertilizers on the crops. We can say that's a synergy to, to coming to church, to meeting with other Christians, to being part of, of a study group, being part of a small group uh, within our church life, reading our Bible, studying our Bible. That's like uh, grow, helping us to grow, isn't it? That's feeding us day by day. How about protecting the crops and harvesting the crops? I said this is caring for others, providing for those who are in need, giving guidance to those that need help to avoid the desires of their sinful nature. Very often, people in, in churches can be, can be tempted in such a way that they need help. We read that, that, that things like gambling can be a big issue in the church amongst Christians. And you wouldn't think, but they can, they can be hooked. And if we see somebody like that, or we, we hear of somebody that might be struggling with their faith, we should be there to come alongside them, to care for them, to guide them, to pray for them, and pray with them, to help preserve them and protect them. Storage and preserving the produce and the crops. The Bible teaches us that the Lord Jesus Christ has gone to prepare a place for us, but he will return again to take those who know him to be with him in eternity. That will be a great harvest, won't it? Can you imagine? We've still got that day to look forward. If the Lord comes when we're still on earth, it's going to be fantastic because there'll be people that are disappearing the Bible says there'll be people in the field. One will be called away and one won't. There might be, you might be in your car factory or your, your office and all of a sudden somebody will see you disappear because you're caught up to be with God, to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a reality of our faith. This is what we believe will happen. It might not be in our lifetime, so we might already be in the grave and we would have gone to be in glory with our spirit. But Lord... Jesus Christ is coming again to take those who believe in him. That's, that will be when the crop goes to harvest, is harvested, the great, the great harvest of the saints. It's our responsibility as Christians to tell others about the Lord. The Bible says he want, that God wants none to perish, some will because they'll reject the word. But he wants none to. He wants everybody to come to a knowledge. And so we should all be willing to share our faith, to tell others about the gospel message. Those who don't respond, who avoid the harvest, if you like, they will be destroyed. They'll be the, the, the seed that's on the side of the field or the crops that have been destroyed by pest uh, or other uh, natural disaster. The crops we we'll just get ploughed in the field. But we want to be part of that harvest, don't we? We want to be part of God's harvest when he comes to take us. Harvest is a time when we give thanks to God for his gracious provision of the crops that help us produce the food that we eat, that help feed the animals. It's all part of an ecosystem. Some, type, some crops are grown just to feed animals and the animals are grown to feed us. And that's part of the natural ecosystem, natural part of the food chain. And it's all God-given. God created the heavens and the earth. He set all this in plan. Such an organized 
wonderful God, a God of order, a God of creation that we believe in. And we benefit from it day by day. And very often it's so easy for the people that don't know Christ, that don't believe in God, to forget how this all came about. Where do they think they got the food from? Where do they think animals came from? We have a great God who created the heavens and the earth. So are we ready to be harvested? Are we still doing the harvesting? Or are we in storage, ready to be collected? As Christians, as members of a church, we may be in different phases of our growth. Have you been harvested? Are you in storage, awaiting the Lord's return? If not, then I would urge you to ask the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your heart. Seek forgiveness of your sins. The Bible tells us that we've all sinned and come short of God's glory. The gospel in a nutshell is said to be, John 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Have you believed in him? Have you trusted in God? Have you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as your own personal saviour? Do you know for certain that when the Lord comes, you'll be part of that harvest? Because if you don't, you'll be left behind. And we don't want anybody to be left behind. We all want to be part of God's harvest. Give thanks to God. Ask Jesus Christ into your life. I hope this morning that perhaps that different take on looking at the harvest has helped. We can draw parallels from a practical world uh, science, if you like, or, or nature, how the harvest grows, the seeds grow, and we can do it and apply it to our Christian life, right from when we were accepting the seed, hearing the word of God for the first time to growing, to being ready for harvested, harvesting and to, be faith, to have that faith and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. In our church, as elders, we try to encourage everybody to be part of a small group, that we can meet together, we can spend time together, socially, just chatting about what goes on in the week, what, what we've been up to, what problems we've faced, but also we just spend time studying and uh, ex expanding our knowledge of our Christian faith with each other and praying, spending time in prayer too. And I would encourage you, if you're not part of a small group, to become one, that we can spend that time and help and encourage each other. Thank you for listening this morning. We're going to have our final song.